So this is a session on the um, egg as a device for needle cricothyroidectomy um, in the paediatric population. So if we're thinking, we've talked a lot about paediatric airways today, this is right down the bottom of the algorithm of difficultness. Um, where we get to the point where we haven't been able to intubate, we can't ventilate, we've got to the point now where we can't intubate, we can't even oxygenate. So this is our kind of last resort for oxygenating the paediatric airway. So we're going to put a cannula either through the cricothyroid membrane or through into the trachea of the child or infant as a method of oxygenating them. So does anyone have any thoughts what sort of number cut off in their head they have for at what age we would use a needle technique rather than using a surgical airway. Yeah, any other thoughts? I would have thought a bit younger. Right. Probably six, four or six. Okay, so looking at all the literature that's out there, very little literature on this, but different manufacturers and different teaching agencies say different things. So I think APLS are currently saying an eight-year-old. Uh, ATLS, I think, is a 12-year-old. Um, very sensible approach in the last group. Someone said I'd have a feel of where the cricothyroid membrane was and see if I thought I could be able to get a tube into it, which is probably the, the correct answer in all situations. Um, but thinking about the cricothyroid membrane, so in a term infant, the cricothyroid membrane is about the size of a grain of rice. It's tiny. so. We're not going to be able to get much through that. Um, so there is some sort of stool of thought thinking, should we be doing surgical airways in everybody? Because we all know the needle crank. It's a way of oxygenating, but isn't really a way of ventilating. Now, doing a surgical airway is probably going to be quite difficult. You're going to have sweaty hands, and it's all going to be a bit difficult, even though we've practiced it for the adult population. So think about doing that in a child. So they might not be able to fit a tube through the cricothyroid membrane, they might have to go a bit further down in the trachea. And when they're doing elective trachees in a, in a child, but often they have to remove one of their tracheal rings, a section of it to actually be able to fit the tube in. So you're going to have a much smaller hole, it's going to be a bit deeper in comparison, uh, it's going to be bloody, and we're not going to have a nice little operating theatre, you know, we're not going to have somebody retracting nicely, so that's going to be really tricky to do. So it's a thought, but maybe, it's going, to, it's going to be a difficult thing. So I think this is probably the best thing we've got at the moment for doing that. So we carry an ink kit, which comes in the pack like this, and it will have a pod of saline strapped to it, like that. So in here, we have cannula, and this cannula is meant for the adult population. This is manufactured as an adult device. So it's really big and really long. We've got to bear that in mind when we're thinking about the infant's airway. It's going to be really shallow, just how big this needle is in comparison. We've got a five mil syringe, we've got our saline to go in there, and we've got the ENC device. So they normally come connected up. So we've got this nice flexible tube in here that attaches to the cannula end. We've then got this section here, which has the holes in for doing the ventilation. We've got this port here. Anyone any thoughts on what this port's about? Some medication? Perhaps. Yeah, so the manufacturers say it's for injecting medication down, so maybe back in the days when we were giving cardiac arrest medications into the trachea. Um, the important thing is that the lid's on that, because if not, that is the biggest hole in the device, and so all the gas is going to escape. So just make sure that lid's nice and secure. Then we've got the holes either side for occluder, and that part's going to your oxygen. So that's the kit. So here we have a model um, that's meant to be an infant airway. So we've got some upper airway obstruction. And then we've got this bit here that's kind of a bit squidgy. Um, that's representing the trachea um, going down to a balloon that's representing the lungs with some soft tissue over it. So you're going to be thinking about what side of the patient you're going to be standing on. Uh, thinking about the head and how much extension you can get on them, a, a child's head to actually do this. You're probably still going to have the chin in the way to some extent. Um, so think about your position. And then we've got the cannula. I'm going to draw two mils into the syringe. So the purpose of putting some fluid into the syringe is to be able to 
to watch when you can get the bubbles through it and just makes that a bit more visual. So you only want a little bit, about two mils, I suggest in the syringe, you don't want it full. That engages onto here. Now what I've noticed when I started having to play with this for doing this session is that the cannula doesn't really engage with the needle that well. So you kind of have to hold that on to make sure it doesn't come adrift. And then what we want to do is we're going to identify our long marks, thinking about which side again you want to be standing on. So we want to pierce the skin. You kind of have to hold both at the same time. Get the cannula so you feel you've gone through the skin. And then you need to kind of advance as you put some negative pressure on the syringe to feel when you're actually through into the trachea. You want to be able to aspirate a full syringe of air to make sure you've gone into the right place. And then hold the needle and advance the cannula till you think you've got enough in the trachea. Again, because it's an adult one, you could potentially go right down one bronchus with it in a very small child. So just um, as much as you feel you need. Take the needle out. Get rid of that somewhere safe. Bit of saline and water still in the syringe. Pop that back on, aspirate again, and check that your cannula's gone into the right hole. Like that, and then we're going to connect it up to the egg. And what they suggest is you do a litre per um, year of age. So, two year old, set it at two litres to begin with. That's two. So all these holes need a clue in, so between your finger and your thumb, you just need to make sure you're covering all of them. Now, because this is a demo one, and so many holes in the trachea now, it's not really inflating it. So we will just transfer to this one. It doesn't have multiple holes in it. You can see it there. So there's different kind of things written in terms of protocols to use. I think APLS suggested that you occlude for one second, um, let the chest rise and then release for however many seconds. So some places say three, some say five, some say up to ten. And really it depends on the degree of upper airway obstruction you've got and actually how much gas you've managed to get down into the chest. So what you don't want to do is keep inflating and inflating and inflating because you're going to get that barotrauma as well as causing the cardiovascular compromise because you're not going to get your venous return back. So you can either do it where you occlude for one and then off for so many and do it like that. Another stool of thought that kind of comes more from um, jet ventilation in theatre is that you occlude for four seconds, you see the chest rise, one, two, three, four, and then you release, in about 20 seconds you should see that upstroke of your sats coming up and then you let the sats drop by 5% before you then do another 2 second ventilation. Again to, to bring the sats back up. Now how comfortable that would be I don't know, if you're setting up, if you're getting up to 100%, 95 is probably still a happy place, if you're sort of 90, 85 with your blue child is probably less of a happy place. So different things, there's no real sort of evidence base out there to say which is better, but I think it's important that we just make sure that because we've got an obstructed upper airway, we need to make sure that there is some release of that pressure in the chest. Again, doing all the things at the top end as well to try to reduce the upper airway obstruction, so putting your basic adjuncts in and things like that. And I think that's about all, so now it's time for you to have a go.